Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Nutrition Made Easy, three uh, principles to healthy eating. My name is Ramon Sedano, and I am the coordinator for fitness services and education over at Washington State University Student Recreation Center. So what that means is I oversee the personal training, strength conditioning, weight room, and well-being online departments. Um, another uh, job that I have here at the university is I'm an adjunct faculty member. So I teach a couple of classes in the kinesiology department one of which is nutrition related to fitness and sport, uh, which is kind of one of my specialties, which is why you have me talking about nutrition. Um, however, in today's lecture, we're not going to be talking about it related to fitness and sport. We're going to be talking about just kind of general, uh, not even requirements, just general guidelines to help lead you to healthy eating to make these things simple. Like the whole point of this entire lecture is for you to understand simple tips and tricks that you can utilize to make eating very simple for you. I know out there there's all these crazy fad diets there's how to lose this many pounds in like x amount of time and you have the ketogenic diet you have intermittent fasting you have the zone diet you have the warrior diet you have all these different things out there and it can just be very overwhelming at times and while those things definitely have you know some evidence to them they have some good information to them and they do work you know it's not like you have to dive into one of these things to make sure that you are developing the best, most optimal, healthy you. So why we are here today is to kind of give you really what is the basics of a lot of those diets and just the simple rules to follow that will make you a healthier individual. Um, so uh, with that, we'll uh, kind of get started in today's lecture. And uh, yeah, I hope you all enjoy. So uh, I want to first talk about kind of, it's always good to give you know the topics what we're going to talk about today so the first thing we're going to talk about uh, and it's really going to be the backbone to everything that we talk about is this concept of jerf uh, we'll discuss eating from the rainbow tips and trips uh, tips and tricks for shopping uh, what nutrient density is and why that's important to you uh, and just the uh, typical consumer uh, marketing schemes and this uh, kind of idea I have called live life um, so first and foremost, that kind of brings me to this concept that was, it's its not new, right? Uh, Hippocrates, way back in the day in 400 BC, had the famous quote that I'm sure many of you heard that says, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So this is just essentially saying what you put in your body is going to dictate how your body works. So we have all, in, in Western culture, we are in this sense of we are not, thinking about preventative care. We wait for things to happen and then we try to deal with the symptoms instead of dealing with the root causes. So we want the pill to fix anxiety. We want the pill to fix depression. All these things start to develop and we're gonna start hammering out and trying to fix these symptoms, which actually may, the, may, the, the root cause may be coming from just an unhealthy lifestyle and that unhealthy lifestyle one of the pillars of it may be you know improper nutrition or unhealthy nutrition other pillars will consider you know uh physical activity and another big one is sleep but of course there's other pillars as well but those are the three big ones um but it's just it's just always funny to me that back in you know ancient times that we already knew that what we put in our body was going to dictate our health and i'm just trying to get back to that I'm trying to make it simple again understand that food can be a medicine for you and it's not even a medicine to fix the problems it's a it's a medicine to not let the problems ever develop so if we can kind of get back to that root and understand that proper nutrition a proper healthy lifestyle is going to help us you know negate these different kind of ailments that develop from us so i just kind of always like bringing that up so moving on to our first concept of our first principles that we're going to talk about for the three principles for uh, making nutrition easy is this concept of JERF. JERF stands for just eat real food. And this is something that me and a good friend of mine, John Kemp, I have to give him a shout out. Uh, I don't know if we really came up with this acronym. I highly doubt we did, but I think we are the ones that are making it mainstream. I have my students all over the university talking about it. We've given other lectures and webinars at other places, and we're really, I mean, we want to make jerf t-shirts, you know, like this is a, a lifestyle that we like to live. And it just comes to the standpoint of putting real food inside, inside your body. So staying away from this unnatural stuff that's highly processed, 
has shelf lives of 250 years and all this kind of nonsense that's out there that is not really what your body was um, meant to break down, digest, and put into utilization of energy production. A lot of these uh, quote-unquote fake foods or unnatural foods that we have are so relatively new to the human digestive system that it can kind of send our system into an alarm, which can cause all kinds of different detrimental effects and stuff like that as well. So we're going to kind of go through some of the process of where we came up with this idea of just eat real food to give you a little bit of evidence of why we believe that it is going to make a healthier you and help lead to a healthier individual all the way around. So how we came up with this concept, or not really us again, but where we really relate it to is um, this concept of a lot of people will always think about a healthy diet is low in fat, or a healthy diet is low in carbohydrates, or a healthy diet is moderate in protein. So they're thinking about these distribution of macronutrients. Your macronutrients are your energy producing uh, nutrients, which is your protein, carbohydrates, and uh, fats, okay? So all these different diets, for instance, the ketogenic diet out there has, it's a pretty much a zero carb, high fat, moderate protein diet. And while it does have lots of great benefits to it and stuff, a lot of people in that in that uh, field, not even in the field, but the people who are consumers of the ketogenic diet start to demonize carbohydrates. Uh, and again, excessive carbohydrates is bad, but so is excessive fat and so is excessive protein, right? So anything in excess is really bad. But what we started to come to realization and when we did a lot of the research on different macronutrient protocols, what we saw was that there's different civilizations around the world who have drastically different mac macronutrient profiles, yet they don't have to deal with all the crazy metabolic disorders and other uh, you know, ailments and diseases that us in Western culture deal with. So a lot of these different civilizations will have a dominantly, uh, you know, carbohydrate diet that we see in a lot of Eastern Asian cultures, you know. And a lot of these different civilizations, like we'll see in the Inuit tribes, have a dominantly high-fat diet. And a lot of other, uh, you know, these civilizations, you know, in some African hunt hunting cultures or even, you know, aboriginals in Australia, they have a, you know, a dominant meat diet or a protein diet. And all these individuals with a wide array of different macronutrient profiles are not getting nearly as sick as we are. And the root cause of that is really twofold. One would be that they are getting their food sources from real food. They're getting their carbohydrates from real sources of carbohydrates. They're not getting what I call cardboard carbohydrates. Your wheat thins, your wafers, all that deliciousness, right? That's not real food. They're actually getting their carbohydrate sources from the fields, putting them into their uh, meals and eating them like that. Additionally, they're also not extremely sedentary. They are physically active and they are doing something. They are not sitting in a desk or a chair all day, not moving their bodies. What seems to happen with us in Western cultures uh, especially is that we have developed technology so far that we are able to sit within a keyboard's reach and have everything delivered to us, okay? Even if you are eating nothing but real food, but you're eating it in excess, an amount, an excess of your total daily energy expenditure and you're not having any physical activity, that can lead to some, uh, you know, metabolic disorders as well. It just seems that we are so pampered and spoiled now, and we've come such a long way with everything at our fingertips is actually going to make, you know, some serious detrimental causes to our health. I think I explained it one time before. I, I feel like where we're going is if anyone's seen the movie Wally, -E, they have like these individuals who are living on spaceships who just sit in these motorized like floating cars that take them everywhere. They're drinking 44 ounce, you know, big gulp sodas and they're just morbidly obese and they don't do anything because they have this technology that is doing everything for them. Um, this is not, if we want to utilize our bodies, this is not what we want. We need to learn, and we'll talk about discipline here in a little bit. We need to learn how to balance this widely technological advanced world with our you know, our primal bodies that we have, because if we don't utilize our bodies in the way that it was constructed over millennia of years to be able, and also the food that was, you know, utilized in it over those millennia of years, it's going to deteriorate, it's going to falter, and it's not going to be healthy, and it's going to lead to a lot of problems. 
So again, this jerk concept really came from the idea that these different cultures, different civilizations had widely different macronutrient profiles, but still never saw or don't see the same uh, metabolic syndromes and diseases and ailments that we do in Western cultures. And I kind of touch on this next slide a little bit already, but this is uh, something that I like to bring up for the evolution of human nutrition. Oh, my slide's looking a little weird right now. I apologize for that, but that's okay. So um, what I'm trying to really illustrate with this uh, slide is if we want to, if we're going to be super intense about how long our, our digestive system has been developing over time, we see that our uh, first fully upright bipedal hominid, the Australopithecus, came around about 4 million years ago. So this is our earliest known ancestor. Okay, so this, if you want to stretch it as far as we possibly can, um, again, there's other types of, you know, creatures that we evolved from even further back, but this is our earliest known ancestor. If we want to start dictating that our uh, uh, digestive system started to develop, we could go back as far as 4 million years ago. However, if you want to be a little bit more conservative, when the Australopithecus line diverges in the sublines of which eventually will rise to Homo sapiens, i.e. us, we're looking around, you know, 3 million years ago, okay? And if we want to be, you know, when first true humans came out, we're looking anywhere, let's play it at the most conservative, one and a half million years ago, or I guess uh, 1.8 million years ago since we're, on, I guess we're 2020, right? Or we're 2018, well, I'm jumping ahead. I've been doing interviews with students who've been telling me their graduation dates for college, which is 2020 and 2021, which is why that's in my head. Anyways, super beside the point. But if we talk about our earliest true human of Homo habilis came around one and a half million years ago. That and being, you know, that's being conservative. That's saying that our digestive system has started to evolve one and a half million years ago. And it's that was based off of what was available to us, really. We were a feast famine kind of, uh, kind of uh, species, right? We didn't have readily available food. We did not have widespread farming. We definitely didn't have Uber Eats, you know. Um, so we didn't have that stuff being delivered to us, right? We were constantly on the look for food, hunting and gathering and getting it and maintaining, you know, real food in our diet. We can go all the way down this line. And the next stop I like to take is when, you know, at the agricultural revolution. So when farming really became prevalent amongst human civilization, which is about 10,000 BC. So about, you know, 12,000 years ago. So... This is when a lot of people were talking like, well, you know, widespread farming started, you know, 12,000 years ago. So we've had 12,000 years to be able to adjust our uh, digestive systems. Well, they may be somewhat right here. The farming back then was much different than what the farming is right now. We don't, they didn't have the mega farms with pigs stacked on top of each other, living in their own filth with each other, all that kind of stuff. We didn't have pesticides being sprayed on massive, you know, uh, landscapes and all those kinds of things. So I would say, what was being farmed at that time was much different than what's going on right now. And with that, they were also doing their own farming. It wasn't like you had like Jim, who was the farmer of this entire, you know, uh, civilization. Everybody had their own stuff going on at their own like little house. And they were having to do all the physical labor to be able to obtain all of that, you know, uh, farm food, farm uh, game and stuff like that. So what we're really seeing is with the Industrial Revolution, and if we're going to be generous, we're going to say it started in 1760, but really with the Industrial Revolution and the technolog Technological Revolution, this is going to start in 1840. And this is when we're seeing manufacturing automation enable mass production and distribution of novel foods and ingredients reflected in the increase of consumption of bread, cereal grains, refined sugars, such as table and fructose, vegetable oils, so on and so forth. So this is now we're giving ourselves, you know, 200 years or so of time to develop to this newly widely available food. And then honestly, if we're going to be super honest about everything, it's not till the 1950s and 1960s when this really widespread, crazy distribution of food with all the high fructose corn syrup, all these preservatives to give really super long shelf time, uh, your super sizes, all this different stuff came abundant. So I honestly really think that this new style of food that we're putting in our body has not really started until it's only been going on for the last 50 to 60 years. And if you look at 
we're developing our new, our uh, digestive system for four million years, and now we've had an abrupt halt, not only in our physical activity, but also in the food that we're putting in our body. We are going to not be able to handle what's happening. These trans fats, these different things that are completely not known to the human digestive system are going to send your system on alarm, cause a bunch of chronic inflammation, which has been shown time and time again in research. It leads to type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes wasn't a thing until refined sugar and high fructose corn syrup and all this added sugar in foods really came about. It was super small amongst our civilization. It was only in adults. And that's why it was called onset diabetes. But now you're seeing it over and over again in, you know, uh, in children because they're just eating so much sugar nonstop, causing so many insulin spikes that your body's not able to utilize the sugar and just builds up in the blood, developing these hyperglycemic reactions and leading to type 2 diabetes. These things are new to the human body. These things aren't meant to happen. It's not what the human body is supposed to go through. So it shows that something is drastically wrong. In our, it's not wrong in our food supply. Obviously, we need to feed a mass amount of people. We didn't have 3.7 billion or however many people that we have right now back then. So, of course, we need to figure out ways to have mass production of food help. But we also need to learn that we don't need to overconsume to the state that we are right now. Um, and also just the lack of physical activity because most of us have desk jobs and we need, let's put it this way. I always explain it like this. The human creature is meant to try to be as efficient as possible because we are used to living in a feast famine kind of time. So that's why we hold fat in our body. Uh, we have like anywhere from around anywhere from like 50 to uh, 70,000 extra calories on our body to be able to survive in times of famine. Even if you are sitting at like a super low body fat percentage, we need to hold on to that stuff because the human body was smart and it knew that it was going to go in times of famine, times of stress where it needed that excess energy on it. Just in the last 50 to 60 years, that's no longer, uh, or let's, let's give it, let's be generous. In the last 200 years, that's not so much prevalent, right? We no longer live to survive. We live to enjoy. So we need to figure out a balance to be able to handle all this stuff that's ready for us at our fingertips, right? I don't even have to go to the post office to get stamps. I can go to stamps.com to get, to get my stamps, right? I mean, there's tons of like Uber Eats is out there. I don't even need to go to the store to get my food. I can sit in my couch, have the Cheetos fell in my belly, like fall on my belly button, find meal, you know, movie stuff tickets in between my belly crease and my groin, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating right now, but it's just, we're turning into sloths and it's because in our nature is we want to conserve as much energy as possible. It's just in our human nature because we never knew when we needed to expend that energy. But now there is not that time when we expend that energy. So we need to figure out some sort of self-discipline in our nutritional habits and in our physical activity to make everything come full circle and get back to what the human body is supposed to be and how it's supposed to work. We'll touch on this stuff again a little bit later in some different slides. But just for some fun, we have evolution of AI, which is, you know, maybe more important for a different day when the androids take over and, you know, cell phones are then implanted in our mind. Hashtag Black Mirror. <laughs> okay, so now kind of coming back to the jerk concept, okay. I want to, uh, so if, if we're trying to jerk, we want, one of our principles is to just eat real food. Um, that sounds you know, it sounds easy to do, right? So it actually is pretty easy to do, but these are some ways to identify real foods from unnatural foods, okay? So let us turn up the beat right now and get down on our real foods and our unnatural foods, okay? So you can see on the left, we have our real foods. On our right, we have our unnatural foods. And for some reason, there's very limited bullets on our real foods, hmm, maybe because there's less things in real food. So first and foremost, Eating real food, that food comes from the earth. Does it grow from the ground? I always say it this way, like I saw uh, my buddy had organic potato chips. I'm like, oh yeah, they came off the tree like that, right? It's those kinds of things, right? Just because it says organic doesn't mean that's how it's going to come in nature. Does it come from the earth like that, okay? We have animal products, right? Obviously, there's uh, our meats, they're natural sources of food. Granted, there's things that happen within factory farming, all those kinds of things that's going to be detrimental to the meat, but still animal products uh, are going to be real foods. Then when you're looking at the labels, they have minimal to no ingredients. They don't have all this crazy stuff that you can't pronounce on the ingredient list. It's going to say lettuce and water, okay? It's not going to say a bunch of stuff. 
when we're looking at our unnatural food, these things are loaded with multiple ingredients. They have food additives in them. They have food coloring, added sugars, hydrogenated fats. Uh, this trans fat uh, concept is crazy. So hydrogenated or trans fat is, was, I, I can't remember if it was in the 50s or the 60s when it was developed. But what a hydrogenated fat is, it's the ability to either remove or add a hydrogen ion. I can't remember what you do with it, but you do something with the hydrogen in a fat. And it allows fats that are usually uh, liquid at room temperature to be solid at room temperature. So this kind of fat has never been introduced into the human digestive system until, you know, maybe 60, 70 years ago. And this is one of the main root causes of chronic inflammation, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular diseases, and all these kinds of things. Uh, trans fat is actually being banned from foods and it's being taken out of all foods. They have a certain amount of time. I believe I heard this like a year ago and they had like a three year period to be able to get trans fat out of different foods on the shelf. So there's so much bad that comes from hydrogenated fat that they're actually going to be removing it from food. So always be wary of hydrogenated fat. I'll be honest, don't worry about saturated, saturated fat too much. I understand that general recommendations is going to tell you that you should only have 10% of your diet coming from saturated fats. However, if you're eating a diet that's coming from just uh, from real foods and you're getting a good distribution of macronutrients and you're getting good sources of saturated fats, you're most likely going to be okay. Um, additionally, when we're looking at unnatural foods, these things have the extended shelf life. I'm sure Many of you have heard about how like a Twinkie can survive a nuclear blast. It's always the example I use. And that's because that thing has so many different preservatives, uh, you know, different types of chemical structures. And it's like highly, uh, in the high fructose corn syrup, the trans fat in there that allows that to last for a long period of time. Well, it's good to have, you know, extended shelf life because it gives food, you know, long periods of time uh, to sit in the shelves, be purchased, and they don't go bad so fast. And we don't have as much food waste. Putting those things in your body isn't super conducive to your health. So it, it has a little bit of a give and take. This is where that discipline comes in. So I wanna kind of move on to some tips for jerking, which kind of takes these concepts to another level. And one of them is this KISS principle. And this is just keep it simple, stupid, right? So choose foods with the least number of ingredients. So we talked about how real foods have little to no ingredients in them. When choosing foods, try to find ones that have the least number of ingredients. We want to avoid sauces, ketchup and barbecue sauce and soy sauce. All these things have excessive amounts of added sugar in them that is going to take your carbohydrate and sugar totals well over the roof. That's going to lead to excess caloric intake that will lead to all kinds of obesity and metabolic and cardiovascular issues. Um, there is, uh, there is sauces out there that are going to be okay. Obviously, if you can make your own ketchup from your own tomatoes and stuff, that's fine. Um, again, anything in excess is going to have some detrimental causes. Uh, you have your uh, hot sauces that are coming, you know, more from peppers and things like that. They're going to have zero calories in them. They'll be all right. Um, but for the most part, those delicious sauces that we love to drench our foods and especially barbecue sauces, maple syrup, all the maple syrup, by the way, has like 45 grams of sugar for two tablespoons. Like it's ridiculous. Um, so just be careful with those things. Again, I'm not going to tell you to give these things completely up, but learn how to use them with some sort of discipline. Uh, shop at your local farmer's market. We are super lucky out here in Pullman. In, in Moscow, our neighboring town over across the border in Idaho has an awesome farmer's market. You get to meet your local farmers at the farmer's market, so you're going to be able to know where your food's coming from. Most of the time, they'll be able to let you go there and see how they're, if you're going to get meat from them, you see how their uh, uh, cattle's raised. If you want to, you can see how it's slaughtered. You can see how everything's done, so you make sure you're getting quality food sources and hopefully that the animal's being treated in a humane way as well. We want to make sure to eat superfoods, things like broccoli, almonds, kale, chia seeds, spinach, eggs, lentils, etc. And there's, you can go online and take a list of superfoods. There's tons out there. When looking at an ingredient or like nutrition labels, let's avoid numbers, avoid food dye number two and things like that. I promise you food dye number two is not a real food. It's not coming in nature like that. A huge important one, especially to you men out there, domesticate yourself. Learn how to cook. You need to know what's going in your body. I know you can go to a restaurant and get a good meal that you think is healthy, but you have no idea all the different things that are being put in there, right? Um, it may have this delicious taste due to a certain like cream sauce that was put in there that has excess amounts of calories put into it with high amounts of sugar and high amounts of fat and or all that in there as well. Um, I'll, uh, and just cooking, when you cook your own food, it, it brings you into a connection with your food that's also important to understand. 
um, grow your own or hunt, right? Grow your own vegetables, grow, get your own fruit trees. If you can provide yourself with your own uh, uh, vegetables, fruits, and things like that, you know how it's grown, you know what's going with it. Same with hunting. Um, you're going to get a lot better quality protein from a wild animal. And then there's the whole benefits of the hunt. Um, coming into tune with nature, you uh, you have a lot more respect for that animal um, once you are hunting it. I understand that vegans and stuff out there are going to disagree with me. But there is something that is, it's not romantic. It's, it's, very, it's a relationship that you build with this animal that you have a connection with. And it makes you appreciate the meat much, much more. Um, eat everything, bulk up, get veggies during their seasons, uh, don't discriminate, eat all the foods on your plate, try to join a co-op, co-ops are great, support your local farmers and your local businesses, for the most part they're going to have good quality foods there, um, and don't don't feed the trash bin, utilize, that kind of goes into don't discriminate as well, right, utilize every vegetable that you have, use carrot nubs for soups, broccoli stalks for pesto, all that kind of stuff, learn how to use everything. So jerfing is our first principle, and our other two principles are going to be a product or a, yeah, a product of jerfing. Um, so again, just eat real food. Get back to what is naturally meant to go in your body and that your body knows how to digest. Now our principle number two is going to be what I call eating from the rainbow. So this means you're going to eat fruits, vegetables, and meats of all different colors. So the reasoning behind this is the reason that foods have different colors in them is because it dictates their different micronutrient and phytochemical profiles that give the food a certain color. So, you know, foods that are usually, you know, colors of red have vitamins A and C in them. Um, foods that are, you know, more purple have vitamins C and K. Orange has got C and A in there. All these different things have different colors uh, that have different uh, micronutrients and uh, phytochemicals in them. And micronutrients and phytochemicals are essential to how your body uh, runs its daily functions. So we'll talk about micronutrients here in a second, but micronutrients are different than your macronutrients. So micronutrients or macronutrients are your protein, carbohydrates, and fats, right? Those are the ones that give you energy. They have calories in them, okay? Micronutrients and phytochemicals do not have any calories in them, um, and they are needed in smaller amounts. It's like your B vitamins, all that kind of stuff. But what they are used for is they allow for the enzymatic uh, reactions to take place in your body that utilize macronutrients for metabolism and energy production for one. There's tons of other things that they do, right? Calcium is always known to help in bone health and other things. Iron is going to help deliver oxygen, uh, uh, increase the oxygen delivery in your red blood cells and things like that. So it's not just for enzymatic functions and metabolism and energy production. That's dominantly your B vitamins right there. But all these uh, micronutrients and phytochemicals allow your body to do the processes that it needs to do to survive and to optimize at a higher efficiency. So you need these things in there and you need them in a variety, okay? That's why eating from the rainbow is good because it allows you to have that variety of all these different micronutrients and phytochemicals without even thinking about it. You don't need to get a bunch of different supplements to do this. And now, in fact, when a lot of people are taking excess amounts of you know certain vitamins, um, the RDAs kind of show that there is no extra increase on performance or optimization of human health when you go above certain, uh, you know, recommended daily allowances. Uh, and sometimes it can be detrimental, right? Your fat-soluble vitamins, if you take an excess amount, can actually be very detrimental to your health. Granted, um, some vitamins in a little bit of excess can show uh, some, you know, uh, not so much performance-enhancing effects for our athletes, but some health benefits as well. But what can happen is if you're only, if you're focusing on so much of taking one uh, one vitamin, there's these things called bivalents or bivalent vitamins and bivalent uh, 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 minerals, which they have competing interests. They're both utilizing things. And if you have too much of one, it's not going to allow the other to do its thing. So you want to make sure to have a good balance of all these things. And eating from, a ra eating from the rainbow is just a simple way to do this. So eat, again, your fruits, vegetables, and your meats of all different colors. Get them in there. It doesn't have to be in one day, but throughout your weekly, uh, you know, your weekly cycle of eating. So when we're moving on to uh, principle number three, this is kind of a simple trick to actually have. This is shopping from the perimeter of the store. 
So typically your fresh fruits and all this stuff is going to be on the perimeter. More in the aisles, you're going to have those, you know, extended shelf life cakes, cookies, pastas, all that kind of stuff in there. And on the outside borders, you're going to have your fresh foods, your meat, poultry, dairy, cheese. Again, you'll have your bakery and you're going to have some bread and stuff there. Um, I'm not the biggest proponent of bread. If you can eat it in moderation, you're fine. Um, but bread, again, doesn't come out of the ground like that. No, but it comes as wheat and, you know, all this stuff. And we're going to be able to break in grains. We'll break it down. So, yeah, there is, you know, I'm not saying get off bread. But if it's not huge in your life, it's probably one of the better things to get rid of. I saw lots of benefits when I stopped eating bread. Again, I don't completely take it out of my life, but um, I, I minimize it drastically. And also what's probably going to be on the outside is going to be the booze aisle. Um, again, everything in moderation, my friends, but again, don't live up your life. But this trick of shopping from the perimeter of the store, it makes things so simple. It, it keeps you out of those dangerous aisles. Um, I promise you, 99.99999% of those cereals that are marketed as healthy for you are dark, are dog crap, okay? Stay away from that stuff. Try to stick to the perimeter of the stores, all that good stuff. Um, so those are our three principles. We have just eat real food, uh, eat from the rainbow, and then shop the perimeter of the store. But now I want to kind of dive into some other concepts that are important that are uh, essentially components of these principles. And we briefly talked about nutrient density earlier. This is going to be dealing with our micronutrients within our foods, okay? So nutrient den density identifies the proportion of nutrients uh, in foods. So nutrients are components of foods that or organism needs to survive and grow, right? We talked about the, uh, the utilization of micronutrients within our foods to help the enzymatic functions or our metabolism and energy production. So those things are needed to break down our macronutrients and be able to help facilitate those actions to take place to allow our bodily functions to work at the highest capability. It's extremely important to have these things in there. Um, so when we're talking about nutrient density, we're looking at foods that aren't calorically dense, like they have lots of calories in them, but they have more micronutrients in them. So nutrient dense foods have a good ratio of macronutrients to micronutrients, honestly, more nutrient than calories. Energy dense foods have higher levels of calories with less nutrients, i.e. what we call empty calories. So things that aren't utilized for proper uh, body bodily functions. An example of this is you can see um, a thousand calorie or a hundred calories from one or from a couple Oreos. I think it's two Oreos is a hundred calories compared to a hundred calories of spinach, right? You'll see the amount of spinach that you get is a huge amount compared to those two Oreos and you're getting a host of micronutrients in there. Um, so you're not having to deal with those en uh, empty calories. So utilizing foods that are more nutrient dense is extremely important for your uh, overall function as a human being. Um, with that, well, not even with this, but there is this concept that drives me crazy, and it's uh, so I can eat whatever I want as long as it fits my macros. So lots of individuals will be like, okay, I know my total daily energy expenditure. So my total daily energy expenditure is the amount of calories that I expend each day, um, and if I eat at that number, I will not lose weight, nor will I gain weight. So say my uh, total daily energy expenditure is 3,000 calories. So if I ate 3,000 calories, I wouldn't, exp I wouldn't lose weight, and I wouldn't gain weight. All right. So then people will do what's called macronutrient profiling. So they're going to do a diet that is 40% uh, fat, 30% carbohydrates, 30% protein. All right. That's actually super outside of general recommendation. So we can go more like 55% carbohydrates. Uh, we'll go 15% uh, uh, protein and the rest coming from fat. That fits more of the general guidelines, which we don't need to go down that rabbit hole right now. But then they think, OK, well, I have 3000 calories. I have my 55% coming from carbohydrates, which is whatever, somewhere around 1,700 calories. So I could just fill those carbohydrates with a bunch of simple pasta, Oreos, chips, crackers, and I'm fine because it fits, you know, it fits my macros, and I'm not going over my total daily, uh, uh, total daily energy expenditure. That's very uh, inaccurate thinking. And that's due to the fact that you're eating a bunch of empty calories with that idea and you're not getting those micronutrients in there that's going to be able to help facilitate those actions that your body needs to put into place for you to uh, optimize and work uh, uh, properly, right? So if you're just eating, even though you're eating at your total daily energy expenditure and you're eating within the macronutrient profiles, you're still not creating the most healthy you. In all honesty, you most likely will lose lean body fat and lean body mass and gain body fat. You may maintain your weight, 
but you're going to lose a lot of the beneficial things that can be on your body, such as skeletal muscle and those kinds of things. And additionally, on the inside of your body, just because you're not losing weight and all that or gaining weight and all that, you have no idea what's going on in your arteries, what's going on with your heart, what's going on with all those different, you know, what's happening to your liver due to this, like what's going on due to the food that you're putting in your body. So this idea of it fit, if it fits my macros, I'm good is faulty, okay? Where we are able to kind of, you know, utilize this uh, philosophy is with your high intense athletes, your bodybuilders, your individuals who already have a lot of lean muscle mass on their body and they need to be able to eat a large amount of calories to maintain the amount of muscle on their body. Um, Ronnie Coleman's a great example. He's an old bodybuilder who is gigantic, you know, 300 pounds of solid muscle. He needs to eat anywhere from like seven to 8,000 calories a day to maintain, you know, his muscle for his body so he can eat a bunch of junk food from that to sustain what he has. However, that individual has had like three back surgeries and a bunch of hip surgeries and can barely move now. So he put his body through stuff that wasn't meant for the human body to do. So again, it's a give and a take. If you are coming from a different, if you have a sport that you have to abide by, of course, you're going to have to do what you need to do to sustain, you know, your caloric totals. But I promise you getting better quality food, nutrient dense food in there is going to make you feel better. It's going to make you live longer and it's going to be able to make you play with your great, great grandchildren someday, which I know a lot of us want to do. And if you want to be a great athlete, honestly, being able to provide yourself with the best uh, way to increase those enzymatic functions of the breakdown of those macronutrients in your body to be utilized as energy during whatever performance that you have, getting quality nutrient dense foods in there is going to help with that. So moving on from if it fits your macros, um, I want, well, we're going to stay kind of in this idea of nutrient density. I just wanted to kind of give examples of different types of nutrient dense foods and energy dense foods. So our nutrient dense foods, we have like, you know, some fresh fruits, vegetables, berries, melons, mangoes, papayas, dark green vegetables, absolutely. Sweet potatoes, tomatoes. We're seeing that these are real foods, right? They're the just eat real foods. Now we're going to go over to this nonsense. So it's many processed foods. We have cakes, snacks, donuts. I, I love donuts too. I get it. Candy, most sauces, pasta sauces are terrible, okay? Low fat and fat free products. What happens when you're doing these low fat and fat free products? All they're doing is jacking up the sugar content within there. So it's a marketing scheme. I promise if you look at fat free milk compared to 2% milk and you look at the carbohydrate and sugar content in there, the carbohydrate and sugar content is going to be double to triple what's in the 2% milk. Don't be scared of fat. Fat's not bad for you. It's an essential macronutrient that you need in your body. The only fat you should be scared of is trans fat. Also, breakfast cereals are super dense in uh, carbohydrates and uh, simple sugars. Breads, microwavable meals, like even this lean cuisine, that is not – just because it says lean does not mean it's good for you. There's all – we're going to talk about marketing schemes here in a second, but there's all these crazy marketing schemes out there to make you think things are certainly healthy for you, and they're not. Um, that lean cuisine is a prepackaged food that's going to last for a long period of time that has to have all this other nonsense put in there to be able to make it last on that shelf for that long of a period of time. So be careful with what you eat, look at the label, look at the nutrient list, and look at the ingredients. Does it have little to no ingredients? Yes, all right, probably all right. If you look at the back of that lean cuisine, it's going to be a host of things in there, okay? Be careful with these things. Stick to your nutrient-dense foods and try to stay away from your energy-dense foods as much as possible until the time calls for it. Again, we're not giving up our lives. I wanted to bring up marketing schemes and just a few right now. Um, marketing schemes drive me crazy. So we talked about the low fat one, right? So typically, um, I don't know if uh, a great documentary uh, for people to uh, watch out there. Oh, I'm just basing on the name of it right now. That's not good. And I just brought it up. So we're going to have to move on right now. If it comes to me, I'll bring it uh, But th there was just examples in this documentary of this poor little girl who was trying to eat all these healthy foods to lose weight. She was eating these low fat foods and she could not. You know, she couldn't lose the weight. This kept coming on. She thought she was eating. She was eating like the Nature Valley bars. That's just sugar right there, too, right? She's eating excessive amounts of grains and granola and stuff like that. And she thought she was eating healthy because it's marketed this way, but it's not. It's not happening for her. It's because these marketing schemes are lying to her. Because not necessarily does low fat mean healthy. Okay. Then um, we have what drives me crazy. We look at the silly rabbit tricks for kids, right? So we're marketing towards kids, and we're marketing essentially candy in a bowl right, as their morning meal every single day. Trix is nothing but a bunch of sugar in there. It's nonsense for you. It's terrible for you. Um, and this is what we're trying to say that is on our kids' menu, right? You go to the restaurant at a, at a 
yeah, you go to the restaurant, you look at the kids menu, you have like dino nuggets and all these different kinds of things that are just, you know, super breaded foods. And granted, I'm assuming they're on there. Uh, I don't have kids, so I'm a little bit biased here, right? It, it, it's easy for them to eat those things because they're tasty. But we need to try to develop some sort of sense of nutritional quality in our youth so they don't turn into the 40% of America that's now obese and then the over 50% that is overweight, right? We need to do something about that. So this marketing scheme towards kids and towards uh, parents of what's healthy for kids just blows my mind as well. Then I wanna go to uh, the hormone-free chicken, right? So hormones aren't even allowed to be put into chickens, okay? So it's just not gonna happen. It's a marketing trick. It's, uh, it's for you to you know spend more money on a chicken because it's hormone-free. Granted, looking at antibiotic free is a little bit different of a story and you can have your own, you know, views on antibiotics in your meats. It's a, uh, there's, you know, research on both sides of that. So whatever your opinion on is that, I can understand why you want to buy antibiotic free chicken or something like that. But I promise you, no chicken has ever had hormones pumped into it. The reason why you have gigantic chickens is due to selective breeding and the ex the accelerated uh, rate of their evolutionary process to be able to develop those genes in their chickens to be able to have gigantic chickens, okay? Um, so that's just another kind of marketing scheme out there too. Then I'm gonna go to like the fig newtons, okay? So we the back, uh, this nutrition label is for these fig newtons over here. So you see the front over here, it's fig newtons made with real fruit, right? That's probably healthy for me. Well, then I go back to the you know label and I see, oh, what, you know, a serving is 110 calories. Oh, it's only got 22 grams of carbohydrate, just 12 grams of sugar, that's not that bad. But when I look at the serving size, that's two cookies, okay? I, I, I said this so many times, I've stolen this joke from somebody else, but who eats two Fig Newtons? I eat Fig Newtons by the sleeve, okay? There's no way I'm eating to take two Newtons. So you see this, and if you don't have the idea to understand what serving sizes are, that person's gonna eat half a thing of Fig Newtons, you know? Maybe get 10 cookies in there. 10 cookies is gonna result, you know, I don't know, however, what's 10 times 12? Like, yeah, that's, that's 120 grams of extra sugar right there, you know? So just be careful about that stuff too. Just understand that things are marketed to you to make you want them. They're gonna make it seem healthy and all this kind of stuff as well when there's all kinds of you know detrimental effects with that as well. Um, it looks like this next slide we're gonna come to is a bit messed up as well, so I apologize for that, but this is kind of an important one, which is the don't stress it, okay? So don't stress it, we, I, I talked about how we no longer live to survive, we live to enjoy. So I've given all these rules about, you know, just eating real food, um, staying away from energy dense foods, trying to eat, you know, from the rainbow, eat uh, nutrient dense foods, all this, that, and the other. While that's all extremely important, we do live in a time where we don't have to live to survive anymore. We don't only have to eat real food anymore. So we have to develop some sort of delft of self-discipline, okay? So we are, we're, we're spoiled right now. We're spoiled with all these treats and fruits of life. And we should absolutely enjoy them because they help bring us together. Food's an amazing thing for, you know, getting together, you know, uh, with families, friends, all this stuff, all these individuals, and it brings people together. There's cultural, uh, you know, uh, differences within foods. It's delicious to try. Like, we should not you know, take those things completely out of our life. If you, how I explain it to a lot of my clients is if you say that I am not going to ever eat sugar again, I'm not ever going to eat Oreos again, I'm not ever going to do this, this, or this. If you say that, those things still control your life, okay? So you need to understand how to be able to apply and utilize those things in a disciplined manner where when you have one cookie, it doesn't turn into a hundred cookies, okay? So enjoy the fruits of life, develop self-discipline to be able to enjoy them without putting your health at risk. I always tell people um, to remember the calendar. If you have one day where you have a pig out and you do all this stuff and you know all this, that, and the other, don't let it be like, oh, well, I'm already here now, so I'm just gonna eat like this for the rest of my life. If you look at one day on that calendar, just in one year, and you mess up on one day, and you have all the other days that are decent, it's probably not gonna be the biggest detrimental effect on you. So I always say, remember the calendar. Now imagine when that calendar turns out to 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. I'm living until I'm 125, so imagine that when, when that turns into 120 years, okay? Um, what we can't see underneath this picture is I uh, always talk about the 80-20 rule. 
So what's blocked out is the 80-20. A way to develop self-discipline for yourself is 80% of the time you should be living by that jerk lifestyle, that nutrient dense, eating good foods and real foods for the most part. But 20% of your life, ha, have fun. Have fun at Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever it is that you celebrate at Thanksgiving, whatever, you know, certain, you know, holidays, gatherings, birthdays, celebrations that bring you together. Enjoy that stuff. Don't be the individual there like, well, I can't eat that because I'm on a diet. Don't think of it as a diet. It's a lifestyle. You're going to be able to eat these things for the most part throughout your time on this earth and be healthy. And then still, if you have that discipline, eat the good, yummy stuff when the time arises. Don't just do it all the time. Develop that self-discipline. If you're a fitness professional out there, though, if you're a personal trainer, you're something like that, you're a strength and conditioning coach, you have to live by the 90-10 rule. You need to be 90% good, 10% bad. We are the exception, and we need to set the example. I'm not telling you to give up all those things in your life, still enjoy them, but you need to set an example for the rest of us. Um, we don't really have any time for questions right now, but I still wanted to show my little cute picture um, because, you know, I said you were the good kind of fat. But with that, um, it was nice uh, chatting with all of you. Thank you for coming to our webinar. I believe we have um, more webinars. We always have webinars going on, so be sure to join Wellbeing uh, in the spring. We have a primitive uh, shelter built. What's, what's it called again? I believe it's primitive shelter building. I'm not exactly sure of the yeah. exact name of it. So be sure to just tune in to all of our uh, webinars, um, especially mine because I'm the coolest, obviously. <laughs> And uh, yeah, again, my name is Ramon Sedano. Um, if you have any uh, questions for me about this presentation, you can contact me at wellbeingonline at wsu.edu. Again, that's wellbeingonline at wsu.edu. I love talking to all of you. I know that some of the stuff that I talk about seems a little bit off of what you've heard before. So I would very much like to explain it to you, send you the research and all the data that I have on it. So with that, um, thank you for your time and it's been a pleasure.